Now, because this is so important, I'm going to run through it on the notes. So the first priority, A with C spine protection. We assess the patency of the patient's airway. We look at the chest movements. We listen for the air going in and out of the patient's nose and mouth. And we can feel for the air. You can put your hand near the patient's mouth and feel the air going in and out with your hand. Or if they're breathing very quietly, you can put your ear down on the patient's nose. And that means you can look down at their chest, listen to the air and feel the air on your ear at the same time. So we need to assess that. If we're not happy with it, we need to consider opening the airway. Now, the chin lift is not appropriate in a trauma situation for an unconscious patient because we can't exclude a C-spine injury. It is appropriate in many medical situations where we're happy there is not a cervical spinal injury. If, we, if there is a possibility of cervical spine injury, we go for the jaw thrust manoeuvre and of course we can also use airway adjuncts such as nasopharyngeal, oropharyngeal airways, laryngeal masks. But if we want to protect the airway from aspiration, the only airway adjunct that will do that is endotracheal intubation with an inflatable cuff. That will give us a patent airway and airway protection. The principle in trauma is assume C-spine damage until proved otherwise. And that is an X-ray of C1 down to C7, normally including T1. In the AP, the, the anterior posterior and the lateral views and assessed by someone very skilled in assessing X-rays, if at all possible, a consultant orthopaedic surgeon. And we use the trinity of protection. This is the hard collar around about the neck, the sandbags on the side of the head, and also taping the forehead down onto the trolley. The three components of C-spine protection, the aim being to immobilise the head relative to the rest of the body. If airway obstruction is present, we want to identify it. It could be foreign material, it could be the presence of vomit. We listen for stridor. Stridor means noisy breathing. And if the Glasgow Coma Scale is less than eight, we should intubate. So a definitive airway should be established if there is any doubt that a patient can maintain their own airway. Airway and C-spine control is our number one priority our number one duty to every traumatised patient. And also we can consider gastric catheters, probably a nasogastric catheter with suction, and this can decompress the stomach, because very often in trauma, the parasympathetic nervous system is not working because of the sympathetic overload, and gastric contents are not moved through the stomach. The stomach becomes distended and vomit becomes likely and vomit of course has a risk of aspiration if the level of consciousness is low. So at some stage we can consider gastric catheters with suction decompressing the stomach making vomit and subsequent aspiration of vomit less likely. Thinking now about the next priority breathing and ventilation. We'll expose the patient's chest to assess them and we will observe for bilateral chest movements. If you look at normal chest movements, they should be bilateral. That's called the chest excursion. So we're looking for bilateral, normal chest excursion. Auscultation, we can listen and the air sounds, we should hear, hear the air going in all parts of the chest as we listen. There should be good air entry into all parts of the chest. Visual inspection, the surface of the chest for any injury, and we can also palpate it to see if we can feel any injuries. We can also percuss to see if there's any dull or hyper-resonant areas as well. And what sort of injuries might be compromising breathing and ventilation? Well, pneumothorax is air in the plural. 
in the plural cavity. The potential space becomes an actual space. That's a possibility. Now, if there's a flap of tissue, that means air can get into the pleural space but can't get out. And that means the pressure in the pleural space will build up, causing a tension pneumothorax. Particularly dangerous because this will compress the heart and the large vessels, moving it to one side. An open pneumothorax we can detect, and these are called sucking wounds because you'll be able to hear the air sucking in and out of a hole in the side of the patient's chest. There may also be rib fractures, preventing normal chest excursion. And a flail segment is where two or more ribs are broken in two or more places, meaning that part of the chest wall is disconnected from the rest of the chest wall, meaning it doesn't move with the rest of the chest wall. And I've actually seen this where you get the proper paradoxical movement. When the chest wall moves up and out, but the flail segment is sucked in the way. Clearly compromising ventilation. And if someone's got a flail segment, that means there's been significant trauma impacted onto the surface of their chest. And underneath the flail segment, there's a good chance there's going to be pulmonary contusion, bruising of the lung also reducing the efficiency of the breathing process. And haemothorax is also a possibility where blood enters the pleural cavity. And of course you can get a haemothorax with a pneumothorax, a haemoneumothorax. The two can go together. So they're the sort of injuries we're looking for. Here's a fairly good saying, all injured patients should be given high concentrations of oxygen. So any significantly traumatised patient should be put on oxygen because we want to maintain optimum saturations in any blood that is circulating around the body to make sure the tissues of the body are getting as much oxygen as the breathing and circulatory system will facilitate at that period of time. If there's still problems with the airway, we can consider a surgical airway. Perhaps a uh, below the thyroid cartilage, above the cricoid cartilage, in the cric through the cricothyroid ligament to, make, to get an emergency surgical airway. If there's a tension pneumothorax present, that should be identified and decompressed as an emergency life-saving measure. This will probably use, involve using a wide bore cannula in the midclavicular line, putting it in about the third intercostal space to decompress the pneumothorax. And of course, always feel free, it never does any harm, to use pulse oximetry to help us to monitor the blood oxygen levels quickly. The only catch with pulse oximetry is the current generation of pulse oximeters cannot differentiate between oxyhemoglobin and carboxyhemoglobin. So if someone's been in a fire, and might have inhaled carbon monoxide, this can give spuriously high readings. Apart from that, pulse oximetry is a useful clinical indicator. So, A for airway with cervical spine protection, B for breathing with ventilation, C for circulation and hemorrhage control, our next priority. And the first thing to say is completely obvious, fix the leak. Stop the blood coming out. That's called definitive hemorrhage control. So you might need to apply direct pressure. You might need to put artery clips and legate bleeding vessels. You may need emergency preoperative care so the patient can have a splenectomy if the spleen's bleeding. Whatever it is, though, you've got to stop the leak. Definitive hemorrhage control means we get the bleeding stopped. So we fix the leak and then we need to put back some fluids. So we give intravenous replacement of intravascular volume. We need to restore the intravascular volume. Bear in mind that bleeding can be onto the floor and four more places. So there's a bit of looking to do sometimes to try and work out where the bleeding is coming from. And we want to assess blood volume and cardiac output. So how are we going to do that? 
Well, the patient, if it's bad, may already be becoming hypotensive. And in trauma, assume hypotension is caused by hypovolemia until proved otherwise. Now, having said that, hypotension can have other causes, such as cardiac tamponade or tension pneumothorax that aren't necessarily hemorrhage related. But most cases of hypertension are caused by hypovolemia, especially if the patient is cold and peripherally shut down, almost certainly hypovolemia. Level of consciousness may or may not be reduced in hypovolemia, so it's not necessarily a, a definitive indicator of blood loss. So it may or may not be reduced in hypovolemic patients. But the skin colour will usually be pale, an ashen grey colour, and white and cold extremities. Now I know this is harder if you're working with patients that are black or brown, as opposed to working with people that are white. So look particularly at the lips, the conjunctiva of the eye, the fingernails, the palms of the hands, the soles of the feet, look where you can. The perfusion of the lips is a good indicator. What colour are the patient's lips? Have they gone pale? In which case the patient is probably hypoperfused. And they'll also be cold. The skin will be cold regardless of what colour the skin is. The skin will be cold because of peripheral shutdown. They will feel cold. And because of the sympathetic stimulation, they can also be sweating. So they may well be cold and clammy. The pulse, of course, is a very good indicator. Peripheral and central pulses, as we've talked about. Best to take central pulses in badly traumatised patients. Of course, we can feel for peripheral pulses. And we're looking at the rate, the rhythm and the volume. And the classical pulse in someone who is hypovolemic through hemorrhage is fast, weak and thready. It will be fast because they're tachycardic. It will be weak because the volumes of blood are low. And instead of feeling like a nice thick uh, string or rope under your finger, it's very thin and thready. The pulse feels thready because the individual stroke volumes are going to be low. So the volume of blood going through the arterial system per cardiac pulsation or per cardiac contraction will be reduced. Fast, weak, thready. But check for central pulses because when the blood pressure is low, the peripheral pulses may go. Of course, we need to get intravenous catheters into these patients. Large bore ones and short ones. So fluid will go quickly through a short catheter and a wide catheter. And we need at least two of these, probably one in each arm, so that we can get large amounts of intravenous fluids into our patients if that becomes appropriate. And initial fluid resuscitation is now crystalloid fluids. This is fluids like saline, normal saline, dextrosaline, or Hartmann's or Ringer's lactate type solutions. Crystalloids don't have the big molecules like colloids and these replace the fluid in all of the body quickly and effectively. And of course, we always want to titrate with the response to see what sort of blood pressure we're getting when we put some fluids in. But the three for one rule probably is going to apply in most trauma situations. This means we give three mils of crystalloid fluid for every mil of blood that has been lost. So if the patient has lost a litre of blood, one litre of blood, they're probably going to need three litres of crystalloid fluid resuscitation. It's probably more than you might think, but this is what has been found in trauma centres around the world, three for one. And the rhyme here is for every big bleed, three for one you will need. Three litres of crystalloid fluid, for every one litre of blood lost. And obviously, if we're running a lot of cold fluids into the patient, the body temperature can drop. So the intravenous infusion should be warmed to round about body temperature or just above body temperature. Now, I'm not recommending a microwave. It would only be for emergency situations. 
Ideally, we have a water bath at 38 or 39 degrees centigrade where we warm the water up in. Failing that in an emergency situation, we could put the bags of Hartmann's or saline in warm water in a sink to warm them up to those sort of temperatures. So all infusions should be warmed. A microwave is used in emergencies, but never put blood in the microwave. You'll, the red cells will just explode if you do that. Now, consider other causes of hypotension, of course, if patients are not responding to fluids. So if we're giving adequate volumes, or what we would normally consider adequate volumes of fluid replacement, but the patient's blood pressure is still low, we describe those as non-responders, and then we have to look for other causes of the hypotension, which may include tension pneumothorax or cardiac tamponade or, cardi or, or blunt chest trauma, which has damaged the heart in some way. ECG, of course, is always useful, completely non-invasive, completely safe. And we can consider urinary catheters unless there's a urethral injury present. So make sure there's no reasons not to put a urinary catheter in. Make sure there's no contraindications. But if there are, the hourly urine volumes that we get from urinary catheters are very helpful to help us to titrate intravenous fluids. So in trauma, we still do like to use urinary catheters. They're very useful. Whereas in renal failure, it's now strongly discouraged. But in this situation, we can titrate fluid replacements with hourly volumes of urine. And of course, we're looking for a minimum of 0.5 mils of urine per hour per kilogram of patient body mass in an adult. More urine than that in a child. In a child, we're looking for maybe one mil per hour per kilogram. And in a younger child, we're looking for even more, two mils per hour per kilogram. D for disability, A, B, C, D, disability, looking at neurological status. So obviously we want to assess the patient's level of consciousness. We can use a alert to voice, alert or alert to voice or alert to pain or unresponsive, an AVPU scale. But GCS is better, Glasgow Coma Scale is better. But assess the le patient's level of consciousness. Then the pupillary size and reaction. Because this will tell us if there's compression of the oculomotor nerve indicating intracranial pathology. First the pupil will become sluggish, then eventually it will become unreactive and dilated. And the dilated pupil occurs on the same side on the same side as the pathology. So if there's a left hematoma developing, it will be the left pupil which starts to dilate first. It's on the same side. Lateralizing signs. Is there any weakness in the arms or the legs on one side of the body that's not present on the other side of the body? That may indicate, again, growing intracranial pathology. But this time it will be on the opposite side. So if it's the right side of the body that's weak, the hematoma will be on the left-hand side of the brain. Whereas with the pupils, it's on the same side. With the body, it's on the opposite side. Then we need to assess any spinal cord injury and the level of that spinal cord pathology. Is it in the cervical spine, the thoracic spine, the lumbar spine? Where is it? <clears throat> and beware, patients may talk and die. Now what this means is that the patient might be talking to you, but then they may go on to deteriorate. This can particularly happen in A&E departments with extradural hematomas, because they're usually caused by arterial bleeds. So the patient may be talking, but the bleeding goes on, then the intracranial pressure starts to go up, and the patient may go on and cone as a result of complication of tentorial herniation. So this reinforces the point we made at the start. Continually reassess your patients A, B, C and D as you go along. Because some patients talk when they come into the department but may go on to die as a complication of secondary brain injury. 
If the GCS is low, that should be a capital S. If the GCS is low, then check the obvious things. Make sure the patient's being oxygenated. Make sure they're being ventilated. And make sure they're being perfused. Because very often, low GCS is caused by pure br poor brain oxygenation, poor ventilation of the lungs, poor perfusion of the brain, not by any intracranial pathology itself. So always check those basic things and correct them if the Glasgow Coma Scale is low. So E for exposure, environment and everything else. So usually we'll cut off the patient's clothes because we don't know what injuries are beneath them and moving their limbs or their body could cause further injury if there's unstable fractures, for example. But we want to control the environment to prevent hypothermia because the hypothermia will inhibit blood coagulation. That's why we warm intravenous infusions and why we warm blood before giving it. Obvious wounds can be protected at this stage with a dressing. Maybe just a moist dressing to keep a wound moist, soaked with sterile saline, or maybe even inodine if we think infection is going to be a problem. Consider any other medical problems, epilepsy, hypoglycemia, other things which may complicate the patient management. And we want to relieve pain as soon as possible without drugs. This could be done, for example, by the position of the patient. It could be done by putting traction on a fracture. It could be done by immobilising fractures with splints to try and relieve the pain without medication. But then as soon as the diagnosis is made, as soon as the patient's been properly assessed, then we want to treat with analgesics as soon as a definitive diagnosis is made. And then we might want to give the patient some quite significant analgesics. So one A&E preparation that we sometimes give, or a group of preparations, is we can give ibuprofen, which is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, and paracetamol, and we can give codeine phosphate as well. Alternatively, we might titrate in 10 milligrams of intravenous morphine, with an appropriate antiemetic. But if we give analgesics at too early a stage, that may interfere with the diagnosis and assessment. So think about ways of relieving pain straight away without drugs, and then as soon as senior medical staff are happy, treat with analgesics to try and make the patient as pain-free as possible. So we've talked about airway and cervical spine protection, breathing and ventilation, circulation and hemorrhage control, disability with the neurological examination with AVPU, GCS, examination of the spinal cord and peripheral nervous system, and E for exposure, environment and everything else. And the last thing I just want to mention is a few possible uh, pitfalls. And one is the elderly. Now, the elderly may have a limited ability to increase heart rate in response to hemorrhage. This means that older patients may not have the tachycardic response that younger people will have. In other words, an older person might have lost blood, but not be tachycardic because they are incapable of compensating. Elderly people may be on anticoagulants, even aspirin, can prolong bleeding time, making hemorrhage more significant. And elderly patients may be on medications for other medical conditions. For example, beta blockers might cause low heart rates. And for all these reasons, severely traumatised elderly patients do not do as well as traumatised younger patients. Now, it's important to mention in children that they are absolutely brilliant compensators. Children can lose a lot of blood but still maintain their blood pressure for a long period of time. They can compensate exquisitely well. 
but then children decompensate very quickly and can crash out very quickly. So deterioration can be precipitous and catastrophic. So we need good observations of children's heart rates, we need to estimate their blood loss, we need to estimate their vasomotor constriction as they compensate, because their blood pressure will be maintained for a long time, but then drop off quickly. And the same is true of athletic fit young people. They can be very good compensators and decompensate quickly. And also they can have lower normal parameters than normal. So a, a young fit person might have a normal pulse rate of 50. So if they have a tachycardia of 101 or 102, for them that might be a very significant tachycardia. So always think about your observations in relation to the patient's normal conditions, not in relation to some sort of hypothetical average that you might have in your head. And we have to constantly reevaluate all patients. So remember, A, B, C, D, E is not a one off assessment. We need to constantly reevaluate it because the condition of patients can change once they are in our care.